sermon. Um, those kiddos were great. And we had them up here live, and then that, God be praised. Grace, peace, mercy be unto you in the name of Jesus, the risen Christ. Amen. As we look at continuing our, our, our series on Let Your Light Shine, we're going to focus this morning on Don't Let Satan Blow It Out. And in order to properly understand that, we have to first understand what is the light? So we got to go all the way back to Genesis, page 1 of the Bible. And Genesis 1-1 through 1-5 says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. God called the light good. And we continue that all the way with John. The Gospel of John, the beginning of John says this, John 1.1 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And while God calls this light good, and while this good light shines in the darkness, and, and the darkness has not overcome it, sadly, not everyone thinks the light is good. Actually, there are some who are opposed to the light, that they would prefer to walk in the darkness. They hate the light. They try to destroy the light. You see, Christians worldwide experience widespread persecution as those who are opposed to the good light, the light of Jesus, the light of the Christian's soul, those who would choose to walk in the darkness, the persecution of those who profess Jesus as Christ, as Lord and Savior, is as old as Christianity itself. But there seems to be more and more evident hostility toward those who align themselves with Jesus and the truth of his word. And not only is it seemingly so that it's increasingly evident, but it becomes so visibly apparent that it is easy to carry out this persecution. Internationally speaking, there are over 60 countries where Christianity is outright banned, where believers of Jesus are beaten, beheaded, tortured, isolated, imprisoned, enslaved, put to death for engaging in unauthorized religious activity. Here in America, while our persecution may be on display on a smaller scale, the reality is that daily we experience attacks on our freedom of worship and references to anything related to the name of Jesus. My friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we should not be surprised why not everyone thinks the light is good. The Gospel of John shows us this dark reality when Jesus returns to Judea, when his friend Lazarus has died. You see, Jesus gets word that Lazarus is deathly sick. And while Jesus loves Lazarus, and he loves Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, Jesus delays going to him. 
John 11 records this for us. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going to go there again? So Jesus wants to make this journey to Lazarus. And you and I know why. He delayed to allow Lazarus to die and returns to him to raise him from the dead so that the disciples would believe in the resurrection, that they would believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. But the disciples, in their human condition, in their sinfulness, in their frailty, they are worried. And they said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going to go there again. So Jesus' answer, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. There were those whose hearts were so hardened against Jesus because the light was not in them. They walked in the darkness. They hated the light. They hated Jesus. No, we should not be surprised why not everyone thinks the light is good. You see, in Romans chapter 6, we read that we are either slaves to sin or slaves to righteousness. I invite you to follow along in your Bible. It's on page 943 if you're using the Bible on the back of the pew in front of you. And we're going to start with Romans 6, verse 15. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, Having, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at the time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit that you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But... The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, just like those who hated Jesus, even in the raising of Lazarus to life, because of their hearts were hardened, when we are slaves to sin, we are consumed by the darkness. Satan has blown out our light. Simply put, our light, our light cannot shine if we are slaves to sin. When we are slaves to sin and cater to our sinful desires, Satan can literally blow out 
our light if we refuse to be a slave to righteousness. When we are slaves to sin, the slavery leads to death. Romans 6.23 says it best, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our slavery to sin is a path of darkness. It is in opposition to the truth and life in Christ. It is destructive. It is damning. But there is a different way. The way of being a slave to righteousness. And while we may think that any kind of slavery is bad, being a slave to righteousness gives us life. You you see, salvation is being released from the slavery and bondage of sin. And once we experience this freedom in Christ, we wouldn't want to go back into that bondage of darkness, but rather we would want to remain in the light of Christ. Romans 6.22, But now that you have been set free from sin... And have become slaves of God. Being a slave of God, a slave to righteousness, is a life in the light. God calls us out of the darkness and into the light through his word, through his gospel. God calls us out of the darkness and clothes us with his righteousness through word, and the water of baptism. This morning, we witnessed this with the very baptism of Charlie. There there was a candle lit because Charlie now has life in the light and now is a light herself to a fallen world. So I have a question for you. When God calls us out of the darkness... And into the light, how do we keep Satan from blowing out our light? I'm going to answer that question for you by looking at a campfire. Since the light that we so often are talking about, the the light of a lamp in the time of Jesus, the light of Christ, the light of the Holy Spirit with a flame at Pentecost, we often think of a flame, a fire, just like the flame of a candle when we celebrate baptism. This summer, Rachel and our sons and I were blessed to spend a couple of weeks in Michigan visiting and reconnecting with our family and loved ones. Campfires in Michigan are a delightful experience in the summer because the nights get so cool. Don't hate me for that, but it just is. And so there are five steps to keeping a campfire burning. First, you've got to choose the right fuel. And second, you need to add stones to the fire. And third, you need to protect your fire from the elements. And fourth, you've got to keep stoking your fire. And lastly, you need to remember that fire needs oxygen. I think it's pretty easy to connect these five steps of keeping a campfire going with what it means to have a light and life in Christ, to be a believer in the faith. So here we go. Choose the right fuel. For a campfire, sure, plastic burns. It's not good. It's perhaps poisonous or toxic. And wet wood, all it does is give off a lot of smoke. You need a fuel that will burn. The world so often saturates itself with poisons and toxic situations, a lot of smoke and mirrors, but nothing that burns true and bright. We as Christians know that our fuel 
is having life in Christ. Our fuel is to be a slave to righteousness. Our fuel is being declared righteous before God because of what Jesus did for us. Whereas being a slave to sin is like a fire of plastic or poison and toxicity, being fueled in Christ is life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is our true fuel, eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Second step, you need to add stones to the fire. You see, when you put stones in a campfire, it burns hotter and longer because the stones hold the heat. For us as Christians, it's no different than having a life in Christ. When referencing Jesus, the Gospel of Matthew quotes Psalm 118. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the foundation on which our lives are built. Just as in baptism we are made new, a new creation in Christ, with Jesus as the cornerstone, The stone that burns bright and hot and long keeps our flame of faith going and going, bright and bright. Next step. You have to protect the fire from the elements. Rain and wind and cold can damage your campfire. These elements will always be around, so you must be prepared for them. And for us as Christians, we too must be aware of the elements that can damage our light, our flame of faith. We have to be aware that temptation, sin, and the devil can bring damage to our light. And we must guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus as we face the attacks of Satan and of our own sinful desires. We must remember that we need to keep, our, keep stoking our fire. Taking care of a campfire so that it lasts a long time, it requires, actually demands your attention. You must keep arranging the coals and the woods to get the most out of your fire and, and make it last. For us as Christians, we too must keep stoking our fire, our flame of faith, our light. We stoke our light with the word of God by studying his word and growing in his word. We stoke our light by remembering our baptism and remembering that we have been made a new creation in Christ. We stoke our light by fueling our fire of faith with the bread and the body and the wine and the blood of Holy Communion. And we need to remember that our fire needs oxygen. It is critical for a campfire to breathe, to have the right fuel of wood and coals with oxygen. And just as a person may sometimes have to get on their hands, knees, and blow on a campfire to to keep it going and or to reignite the embers. For us as Christians, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit continues to breathe life into us, continues to breathe fuel into our flame of faith. And whereas Satan wants to blow our light out, the Holy Spirit blows life into us and keeps our light alive.